Peter Daniel's website. And again, I just want you to know that the Lord is about to expand us. He's about to enlarge us. I hope you have your seat belts on. Peter Daniels came from a disadvantaged background in his early years, was plagued by illiteracy and ignorance. Yet he built a large business in real estate in Australia, Southeast Asia connections. He served on international boards covering the four corners of the earth. For a third of a century, he successfully studied, absorbed, and experienced firsthand the elusive field of business and at times has worked with some of the most dynamic corporate and intellectual giants of the last century. He is personally wealthy, has a no-debt philosophy. His keen intellect, experience, and sharp mind produce simple, effective answers to complex problems. He's committed to the free enterprise system within benevolent boundaries and is subject to strong principles. He's an international author of substance and quantity quality and is one of the world's most highly paid strategic planners and public speakers. His interests have given him a worldwide network of contacts that has led to as many 200, as many as 200 air flights annually to meet the schedules. Nevertheless, he can always be contacted and endeavors to meet any professional need. He is a gift to the body of Christ from God. Would you please welcome this morning, Mr. Peter Daniels. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you, Pastor. I'm delighted to be here this morning. I hope you can understand my accent. I have some problems with yours. <laughs> well, you talk about food and you call it chow. That's Chinese. You talk about the great prairies and that's French. You talk about the corrals and that's Spanish. And when I meet you, you say, there you go, and I haven't gone anywhere at all. <laughs> if you have your Bibles with you, would you open up the first chapter of Joshua starting at verse 5? First chapter of Joshua starting at verse 5. And we're going to look into the pages of biblical history as the word is breathed by God himself. First chapter of Joshua, starting at verse 5. And it says these words, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Now this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. I believe those words. I believe they're as valid today as the day they were written just so many years ago. Now, other than what the pastor has shared with you just a few moments ago, I'm not sure what else has been said about my coming, and possibly I should give you some background. First of all, I'm 73 years of age. My wife and I have been married for 52 years to each other. We have three children and eight grandchildren who think I'm the fourth member of the Trinity. 
My daughter said to me the other day, she said, Dad, you're spending too much money on the grandchildren. Aaron said, Mum, leave Poppy alone, he knows his job. <laughs> Caleb phoned me the other day. He said, Poppy, can I come and live with you for a while? I said, have you cleared it with your mother and father? He said, yes. I said, I'll be around to pick you up in a couple of minutes. I said, aren't they treating you all right? He said, yes. He said, but not as good as I get when I get with you. <laughs> <laughs> I came from a third generation welfare recipient family. My family had never made a mark and I've searched back 500 years. I had uh, four fathers and two mothers. Most of my relatives had free board and lodgings with King George VI. That meant they were in jail. <laughs> I've uh, never gone through formal schooling. I've never had the disadvantage of going to university. <laughs> At 26 years of age, I was an illiterate bricklayer and stonemason. I had great problems in articulation, great problems in comprehension. I went to school as a normal child goes to school, but I went very late. I was much older than the other children. I had, had come out of hospital after suffering the debilitating disease called diphtheria, and I was skinny and weak. And they tried to do some educational assessment on me. And they said, this kid, He's just one brick short of a load. He's not playing with a full deck. His elevator doesn't go to the top floor. And they're going to put me with a group of brain damaged children called an opportunity class. Until along came a teacher called Miss Phillips. She would make the rock of Gibraltar look like a marshmallow. <laughs> uh, I, she, I've often thought in retrospect that she could kickstart a jumbo jet. <laughs> with her left leg and a shoe off. She would make the rock of Gibraltar look like a marshmallow. And uh, she said, he's not brain damaged, he's just plain stupid. <laughs> and for three years she punched me, she kicked me, she slapped me, she didn't get any sense into me or out of me. She used to get me by the chin and rattle my teeth and say, Peter Daniels, you're a bad, bad boy and you're never going to amount to anything. And that became a self-fulfilling Prophecy at 26 years of age, I was a bricklayer, stonemason, uh, hopelessly in debt. But on May the 25th, 1959, I went along to a Billy Graham crusade in Adelaide, South Australia, where we live. And when I heard the gospel in clear terms for the first time, I suddenly realized I was equal with all men before God, and I reasoned that if I was equal with all men before God, I no need to accept any quality with anyone. I was a son of a king. And I wish you could know the difference that that makes. Well, I suddenly didn't become intellectually brilliant, but I knew that I knew that I knew that something had happened. And someone took hold of the book of Joel and read these words, I will restore unto you the years the locust has eaten. And I wanted that restoration, but what if you come from the other side of the tracks? What if nobody is interested in you and then God gives you two dreams so big you can hardly comprehend it? How do you handle it? Well, I wrote it on the back of a cereal package. Everything I had to have done by my 85th birthday before I moved into second gear. One of the dreams was to see how much money one human being could give away in their lifetime. Now, I'm not talking about being ordinarily poor. We had to reach up to touch bottom. How do you handle that? Well, I found the best helping hand you can get is the one at the end of your own arm. And I went down and I, I bought three dictionaries. I put one next to my bed. I put one in the toilet. That's a good place to read. <laughs> and I put one in my excuse for a motor car. Now, I need to tell you about this motor car. This was a 1937 Ford V8 Clubman sedan that had been rolled three times. The hood was crushed in, the windows were gone, we'd kept the doors on with wire. It wasn't the cost of the gasoline that bothered me, it was how much oil this confounded thing used. <laughs> I drove it very carefully, I could get 14 miles to the gallon of oil. 
I used to purchase second-hand sump oil and keep it in the trunk with a plug spanner. And, and uh, if anyone showed any disrespect for my motor car, I would stop it in the middle of the traffic. I'd let a bank up. They would swear at me, they would shake their fists, they'd hit their horns. I'd just sit there. You can't move me. When it was all backed up, I'd put my foot on the clutch and slap it on the accelerator and I would baptise them in oil. <laughs> I kept pointing to words in dictionaries and getting people to tell me what they meant and then I'd check with two or three other people to make sure the first one told me the truth. You've seen Crocodile Dundee, Australians are great kidders. Wherever I go around the world, people say, what are Australians like? Well, we're a very balanced people. We have a chip on each shoulder. <laughs> well, I started pointing to words in dictionaries and getting people to correct me. Then I'd check with two or three other people to make sure the first one told me the truth. I went through those dictionaries frontwards and then backwards until I understood every single word. Then I read 2,000 biographies. I haven't got polygrip, I said 2,000. Then I studied law, accountancy, philosophy, theology, modern ancient history, politics and economics. I found the mind was like a muscle and it could be developed. And then I went into business. Lost everything. <laughs> I want to tell you, that'll clear your sinuses. <laughs> I paid it back and went into business again. Lost it again. I mean, you learn nothing new from the second kick from a horse. I paid it back. I was going in the business third time. My wife said to me, Peter, just get a job. <laughs> just get an ordinary job. Be a garbage collector, anything. Just get a job. Just have some regular money coming in. She said, uh, Peter, the winter's coming. Peter Jr. needs shoes for school and, and Graham needs a sweater and I'm pregnant again. And you've spent all this money on books. I can't see anything happening. You take three steps forward and four steps backwards. She said, I can't see anything happening. On our 33rd wedding anniversary, I bought a beautiful necklace. I mean, it was 49 carat opal with 33 diamonds on. This thing's so big, when she walks, she has to walk like this. <laughs> I said, you haven't complained about the books and tapes I bought lately. <laughs> but I, I, went, I paid it back the second time, went into business the third time and lost it again. What do you do when your dreams start to fade? You reach for one more dream. We should never give up, let up or shut up until God takes us up. Well, I went into business a third time and lost it again. Paid it back and went into business a fourth time and built one of the largest real estate corporations of its kind in our nation with offices in Singapore and Hong Kong. We sold those out many years ago. Today, our business interests spread almost around the entire world. We're very unusual in business. We have no overdrafts, no loans, no mortgages anywhere in the world. We've never been sued. We've never sued anyone. Um, we are the only corporation on the face of the earth that has its own private currency. We're the only family in the world that has its own private bullion bank called Anglo Far East Bullion Company. Now, my mind works a little bit different because I've never ever gone through formal schooling according to psychologists and, and others. They say you have a very different mind. You can read eight books at the time. Uh, and uh, would you believe a Texan paid me $1 million for 15 minutes advice. He made $120 million. You're not that smart. It really only took 10 minutes, but I say 15 minutes because yeah, it sounds better. <laughs> An Australian company paid me a million dollars for advice. About eight years ago, we did two films on economics. We contested it against 1,600 other major corporations in the world at the Video and Film Festival in Chicago, including General Motors, Ford, Mercedes-Benz, Boeing, we won. We won the gold for directorship and the silver for content and it was on biblical economics. It took us to the top 10% of advisors in the entire world on economics. Now I'm your wake-up call. I'm not coming back. I come once. 
Tomorrow night, I'm going to show you how to go into business and win every single time. I'm tired of Christians being broke. You stay in a job. You know what job stands for? Just over broke. It's time for you to take back the economics. It's time for you to stop being employment fodder, suffocating in the amorphous glob of sameness. Now, Tuesday night, I'll get two men and two women out of the audience, bring them up here, and I'll set their life goals for them from a biblical perspective and show you how to hit it on target. But I'm your wake-up call. Within the next 10 or 15 years, we're going to have one of the biggest financial challenges in the history of civilization. And you need to build a heritage for your children's children. All my grandchildren sit up in bed of a night with their briefcase full of gold and count it. And let, I'll get away from this pulpit for a minute. I want to talk to the ladies. Ladies, give your husbands a break. You're yakety, yakety, yakking at them. You're beating up their ego. You never give them a break. You keep onto them and onto them and onto them, crushing their ego. You're trying to make them like you. They'll never be like you. God made them from the dirt. <laughs> They're grubby. They do grubby things. They say grubby things. Stop trying to make them like you. They're never going to be like you. Some of you are challenging them all the time and you're beating up their ego. God will hold you responsible. And fellas, be nice to your wives. They weren't made from the dirt. I wake up my wife every morning of her life with cafe latte and marmalade on toast. It's called self-preservation. <laughs> She's not responsible for anything she said in the morning until she has her coffee. But we've got to stop all this bickering and fighting and, and carrying on like this. My Bible says, how do you know if they're Christians? By the love they have for one another. I had to get that off my chest now. <laughs> God gave me another dream as a young man 46 years ago to change the world for 300 years. We pulled the switch on May the 25th this year. Over the next 20 years, I'm going to put one million Christians in the English-speaking world into freehold business of their choice through the local church, and we're going to bring in over 200 billion for evangelism. Be the biggest financial impact in the history of the Christian church. I know that some of you say, how can one person change the world in their lifetime? Well, let me remind you that Abraham changed the world in his lifetime. Moses changed the world in his lifetime. David changed the world in his lifetime. Peter changed the world in his lifetime. In more modern times, a man called Mahatma Gandhi with what he called Satyagraha, which was soul force. He broke the chain of colonial power. He changed the world in his lifetime. Henry Ford changed the world in his lifetime when he set the world moving via the automobile and Roger Bannister changed the world in his lifetime when he ran the first four minute mile and he proved that the efforts of human endeavor are yet to come. My hero, Sir Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill, the last great English bulldog. This man that mobilized English language and sent him in the battle when he said we will fight on the beaches, we'll fight on the landing ground, we'll fight in the field, we'll fight in the streets. We're growing confidence, we will fight in the air. We will never surrender. And never before on the field of human conflict as so many owed so much to so few. So let us brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth would last for a thousand years, men would still say this, this was their finest hour. He changed the world in his lifetime. Bach and Beethoven changed the world in their lifetime as they expanded our consciousness in the area of symphony and song. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he changed the world when there on Capitol Hill before the Lincoln Memorial, when he gave that famous speech that said, I have a dream. He said, I have a dream that my four little children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of the character. I have a dream today. And so we have traveled 12,000 miles, 31 hours to get here. 
to ask you a very simple question. I hope it haunts you for the rest of your life. I hope you wake up at the night with this question ringing in your ears. It's a question that Joseph's father asked his son when he said, My son, what is this dream that you have? What is this dream that you have? For many of you, it was alive and well when you were a little younger. You'd go for a swim at the beach and lay on the warm stand. You'd stand in front of a wood fire on a cold winter's night or under the starry heavens of a hot summer night and you would do what men and women in all ages have done. You would contrast that picture of what you are against what you would like to become. And what we'd like to do over the next 72 hours is turn back on that dream machine. There are people here, and I don't have to be a genius to know this, there are people here that think they've lost their dream. There are people here that keep pushing it back when it comes out. You know you're born for something bigger. You know you've got something to do. You're not here to be employment fodder. You're here to do something great. Well, we're going to turn back on that dream machine. I can't do it if you don't come to the meetings. Tonight we're going to do something quite unique and you better bring your seatbelt. But Monday and Tuesday night we're going to show you how to go into business and win every single time. And older people, stop telling your kids how great they're going to be. You affirm them, you tell them they can do anything they want and they can be, be President of the United States if they want to be, but they look at you. If that's right, Mum and Dad, why didn't you do better? Why put the hard stuff on me? And America and Australia has the same statistic. We have the highest teenage boy suicide rate in the entire world. It's not in Kosovo, it's not in Calcutta, it's in your country, in my country. And I tell you what, we tell our kids that they can do it. And we put this heavy stuff on them and they look at us and they say, well, why didn't you do it? I hate being with people my own age. They're always glorifying the past. It was not that good. I was there. <laughs> oh, I look at this man called Joshua. Oh, some of these people of old can stir our blood again. I think of Billy Sunday when he's when he preached the gospel and he fought against sin, he said, I'll fight it as long as I got a fist. I'll kick it as long as I got a foot. I'll punch it as long as I got a, an arm. I'll, I'll bite it until I got teeth. I'll, I'll bite it until I've got, as long as I got a head. And when I'm all fitless, footless, and toothless, I'll gum it until I go home to glory. And it goes home to perdition. You see, we come here every week in a sense to reassess the Great Commission, not in relationship to its validity, but to our productivity. Productivity is inseparably tied to purity. The scriptural call has never been more valid than it is today, but the productive results from that call have never been so shallow. The question must not be asked here this morning if God is willing. The biblical record and the spiritual history of Christendom confirms, reaffirms, and future affirms that unshakable and immortal fact. There are simple questions that we need to ask ourselves as Bible-believing Christians. One is, what is the real world we live in today and its projection into the future? I wish you could be with me when I meet with members of the World Bank and the United Nations. I wish you could see some of the things that are happening in the world that never reach the television stations, never reach the radio or the newspapers. They never allow the truth to stand in the way of a good story. <laughs> Secondly, what kind of personal and corporate dynamics are needed to conquer that world? The way that we're behaving with the gospel today is like trying to move Mount Everest with teaspoons. And thirdly, how can I as a Bible-believing Christian weld my current and future life power into a lifetime, invincible, non-surrendering, victory, fighting force for God? You see, we, we look at the glories of the past. We overlook unbelievable indiscretions and errors. We don't understand something about the crusade and the forced baptism under Constantine. We don't understand that in 1840 the Church of England used to auction the right to collect tithes at a public auction house and the one that bid the lease got the power of the church and the government to force people to pay their tithes. I mean, we, we, we overlook so many things. And yet through it all we see emerging the saints of God, standing majestically tall 
against an old world that had basically a rural population, poor communication, and often oppressive and severe government and legal systems. But the world is very different now. And we must not measure ourselves against or use a mentor as a saint or the conditions of the early days, the giants of a bygone era, or the mediocrity of the present to set our course. Jet travel has made the world geographically different. It's shrunk to the size of a golf ball. The monetary system is different. The military components are different. The markets are different. People's expectations are different. Even our lifespan is different. And let me tell you, out there in the real world of commerce and industry, the, uh, the average Christian has not got a very good name. They say you're lazy. They say you lack ambition. You talk about faith all the time. Uh, you talk about it, you read about it, you pray about it, you sing about it, and then you go out and get the job of the most security in it. You expect people to believe you. We ought to be the greatest entrepreneurs in history. We, we believe a Bible. We, we believe a virgin birth. We believe that that Bible is inerrant in its original form. And read Revelation. We're the good guys. We win. But even in Christian's weakened state, let us hear no cowardly call for surrender or any uncertain sound from the bugler. Because even in weakness we are strong. And if the Christian church, if the gospel were to remove its voluntary help and care for the age, the disadvantaged, the sick and the hurting, and the strong ministerial support that you put throughout this great nation, then the economists, the captain of industry, the trade union movement, and the government would find that your economy would collapse and be in chaos within 90 days. You see, it is the Christian church that has always been the great silent unsung hero of every generation, by which its very sovereign charter needs to call afresh with a strong and urgent voice that our pro protection and our prosperity does not come from a sword or from a microchip or from our vast factories or from a political system or from the state it comes from the hand of God but we are moving towards a new era of Christian development which has its deep roots in our early biblical records that may call again for believers who pay any price who bear any burden who will endure any hardship or make any sacrifice to risk any insecurity to reach the subliminal goal of that gospel call. And in modern terms, that may mean a total commitment to personal development and the use of new and strange technology to get the job done. In our comfortable, safe and wealthy nations, the poverty mentality of Christians is a master stroke of satanic genius. I financed some of the greatest theologians in the world with one question, what was the value of the gold, frankincense and myrrh that was given to Jesus at his birth in today's currency? They said no one's asked that question for 2,000 years. And I said, well, it takes a crazy bricklayer to ask a question like that. They said, well, God's not interested in numbers. I said, he wrote a book called Numbers. Wake up. <laughs> they said, how would we ever find out? I said, what if I finance you? They said, we'd like to do it. <laughs> Two years later, they started to come up with some evidence. They came down through Persia. They read all the tablets. They looked at all the historical records, and they found that when the Magis came down, they were escorted by a huge army. Part of the army was 10,000 crack bowmen that had already defeated a legion of 10,000 Roman infantry to protect the treasure. When they came to the city of Herod, you'll read in your Bible that the people were troubled. Well, of course they were, because if you look in your history, you'll find that uh, they were fighting a war somewhere else, and the army was out of the city, and they could have taken the city. They arrived at Jesus' home when he was about 22 months old with a Shekinah glory shining down. And they unrolled all the treasure from the, the camels. They laid it at his feet and spread it out. Some of it, we believe, was from Solomon's temple. Have you any idea what it was worth? Try 400 million American dollars. Our Savior was beyond wealth. He could turn the water into wine. He could multiply the loaves and fishes. He could stop the wind when he won the donkey straight at the showroom floor and had never been ridden. I mean, why do we try to put him in a box? Read your Bible about Abinadab. 
We've researched Abinadab to find out why did God give Abinadab the Ark of the Covenant instead of giving it to the priests or the prophets. We've re researched him through the, the Jewish synagogues and found that Abinadab was a famous entrepreneur. We look at the story of the talents and in Jesus' time there were two talents. There was the royal talent and the, and the, and the standard talent. The standard talent was 30 kilos of gold. The royal talent was 60 kilos of gold. What was Jesus talking about? You see, we, you know, this poverty mentality has impoverished us for decades. It is denied that every Christian is of royal blood. And let the word of God go forth from this day onwards. That we are not pygmies, we are giants. We are, uh, we are not the downtrodden, we are the uplifted. We do not have a message of death, we have a message of life. And the battle cry is to be to cry to our God to give us unction, action and victory. Joshua was a leader. Are you? Are you a leader? For a number of years I was chairman of the board of directors of the Haggai Institute of Advanced Leadership Training in Singapore and we would fly in up to 65 world leaders at a time, people like the chief of Interpol, nuclear physicists, major generals of armies and we would retrain them in leadership techniques, how to break the preoccupational barrier, cross-cultural communication, economics, politics and you'd get these great leaders together and you'd expect them to be gregarious and hospitable and get on well with one another. Now they fought like cat and dog. You see, uh, I have 6,000 years of history on my office wall. And the thing that I learned from history is that we do not learn from history. And I've seen the famous and the infamous that have made their mark on this world by their leadership. And that leadership has always been raised under the shadow of conflict. And I saw the children of Israel go from slaves to conquerors, from wanderings to permanence, to poverty to riches, from aliens to nationhood, from fear to courage, from history observers to history makers. Joshua was a leader. Are you? He made progressive use of time, talents, tools, tactics and troops. He was a confidence anchor for the timid children of Israel to cling to. He was under God, the directional compass set on a predetermined course to the promised land. He was chosen by God to motivate, to inspire and to provoke others to desirable action. Joshua exhibited leadership, not brinkmanship. And if we as Christians do not have leaders inside and outside the church, then we have not recognized that we are at war. And under such a situation, we're going to be destroyed through lack of leadership. Joshua was God's man for the moment. He was Moses' man for the continuance. He was Israel's man of destiny, but he lived, loved, and followed the commandments and the principles of God. But you know, to encourage success, business success, or leadership of any kind in a church can be a very threatening, threatening experience. Because they do not conform, they are not easy pacified by platitudes or empty rhetoric. They can be aggressive, visionary, arrogant, optimistic, rarely subjective, but boy, they produce. They commit and they persevere. I mean, we say all too glibly, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Then we give lie to that assertion. We behave like failures, think like failures, talk like failures, plan like failures, give like failures. And then if by su some surprise we wonder why we're failures. We need to come to the realization that we can only be a failure by our own consent. God has never robotized the mind of man. If you are not going to make it in the United States of America, you cannot make it anywhere. Let me tell you, we pray for your country. We don't want China to be a world leader. We don't want Japan to rise again. We do not want old Russia to rule the world. With all the faults of the United States, you've been the most benevolent nation in the history of the human race. We want America to stay the superpower. But you're God's rescue squad. And you're retreating. The Bible says, remember your leaders, obey your leaders, greet your leaders. If there was such a man, a little green man from outer space and said, 
take me to your business leader, you wouldn't know who to take him to. The church is in desperate need of leaders, says William of Stancher. I want to hear a voice, but no voice comes in a world of flame. The voice of the church has sunk to a pathetic whisper. But the Bible has given us dominion over everything. It says that in Genesis 1.28, in Isaiah 55.3, we're told to lead the way. In Romans 13, we're told to create order. In Galatians 5, we're told to keep out error. In 1 Corinthians 24, we're told to fight the wind. In 2 Corinthians 9, we're given power. And in Matthew 4, 5, we're called salt and light. We, we, not, not those others, we are the light of the world. Which means we should lead the way. We're salt, which means we should penetrate everything. Leadership for a Christian is not optional, it's mandatory. You are a leader in effect or you're a leader in self-imposed exile, but you are a leader. And I hear the lament, no one will help me. Oh, help yourself. Amen. Grow up. We've got a lot of infantile, adolescent adults. And the first thing I see of Joshua, leadership is total life. Not running, running ahead of a crowd with a flag, it's not grandstanding on a platform. Leadership is lifelong, it's not a burden to be accepted lightly. Leadership is accepting the full responsibility. Leadership is climbing when others are faltering and God works through optimists and God is committed to our development. The second thing I see with Joshua, leadership must stay above the commonplace. Total commitment leaves no room or accommodation for fear. I think of Paul preaching Christ. I mean, this guy, this Paul the Apostle, we've researched him, and we have our own research team, and, and they say he stood about five feet tall. Can you imagine him shipwrecked and maybe washed up on the beach, and someone would say, is that you, Paul? Paul, Paul, is that you? How do you feel about the love of Christ today, Paul? And Paul would shake off the sand and stand up and stretch to five feet and get, try and get another eighth of an inch and stick out his chest and his shoulders back and bark out the words, I'm ashamed. And when he got the sting of the lash, someone would have said to him, Paul, how do you feel about your missionary journeys today, Paul? And he'd stretch up his high five foot and put his chest out and his shoulders back and say, I'm ashamed. Then when he was stoned and the flesh was literally falling off his back, someone would say, Paul, how's your gold program going today, Paul? You said I pressed towards the goal. How's it going today, Paul? And he'd stand up and say, I'm ashamed. When he was thrown in prison, what do we hear? Singing. Boy, you need a gun, a whip and a chair to handle a guy like that. <laughs> you see, we are an uncommon people in an uncommon cause in a very common world. The Bible says we're a peculiar people. Half of us are nuts. <laughs> I've met you. <laughs> but we're a royal priesthood. Don't mess with us. It's above bickering and petty gossip. If you're going to be a leader, it better be above bickering and petty gossip. I've studied your history. When I was in the Ukraine the other month, you know, they were surprised that I understood their history. I've, I've been a student of history for 46 years. I mean, at one time during the uh, American Civil War, the only person who was winning battles was General Grant. The other generals, they, they stomped around the presidential house with Abraham Lincoln and they had three meals a day and slept in a soft bed at night. And they got jealous of General Grant and they started to pull him down the eyes of the President. They said, oh, Mr. President, don't you realize General Grant drinks whiskey? He said, really? They said, yes, lots of it. Oh, he said, find out what brand it is and send a crate to my other generals. He went battles. <laughs> you see, we must always be occupied by the final goal and not preoccupied with judgments on other groups. There is no evidence to suggest that leaders in any field indulge in verbal frivolity. And we must exercise creative imagination. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And we begin to get the picture from God's point of view. We become what we think about. You must develop and exercise perception and imagination. And you must not be intimida intimidated or put down, irrespective of who you're what you're up against. Back in 1973, 
I fought pornography in the first time for 200 years in the British Empire. I stopped them from using women as pornographic objects. I had gangsters chasing me all over the place, but you, you're not going to shut me up. You know, it's time, men, you started to stand up for your women folk. The time that you started to lead instead of being a passive follower. Women want men. They don't want half woman, half man. My friend just wrote a book called Muscular Meltdown. I mean, show you... I know you got a bit of B.O. occasionally, but... But you're a man. Stand up for it. And don't be alarmed at hurtful accusations. When you start to show what you're made of and start to show your leadership, some dear friend's going to tell you on an ego trip. The ego does not need to be crushed, it needs to be redeemed. The third thing I see with Joshua, we have a biblical morality. We're not something different on Monday than what we are today. I was sharing in the first service that I uh, I'm a military historian uh, and I saw a black and white film recently with Errol Flynn and it called The Charge of the Light Brigade. Whoa! And uh, I, I was transfixed to the television set because I wanted to see if it was historically accurate but the background was it was the Crimean War and there were 600 horsemen in a fort and they went out for, uh, for military exercise. When they came back the enemy had come and killed the women and children and burnt the fort. They were enraged, they want to go after the enemy but they were under strict orders to maintain the fort and they'd have to wait for a garrison before they could attack and they were under strict instructions even if they saw the enemy they'd have to send a runner not to attack them without the rest of the garrison. Well, they stayed there for months and months and months and then they were out on exercise one day and they come to the top of a hill and they look down and there was the enemy. They were 600 but the enemy was 20,000. Suddenly they wanted to attack but they were under strict instructions not to attack. They sent a runner to get the rest of the garrison but somehow something was transferred to the horses and they started to dance on their feet. They knew that something was going to happen and then against all orders the bugler took the bugle and he blew the charge of the light brigade. Suddenly they snapped together and they started to come down the hill. There were 20,000 enemy down there but 600 coming down. They looked up, they laughed at them but suddenly they started to panic and they started firing cannons. They took a row of riders here and a row of riders there. Lord Tennyson wrote a great poem about it. He had cannons to the right of them, cannons at the left of them, cannons in front of them, volleyed and thundered, stormed up with shot and shell. Boldly they rode well into the jaws of death rode the 600. As they got closer and closer to the enemy they came within rifle shot and the bugle call was normally all officers to the rear all officers to the rear but not in the charge of the light brigade it was all officers to the fore they must take the full frontal attack you can't lead from behind if you're a leader, you ought to be the first one here at church, the last one to lead, the first one to volunteer, the first one to offer uh, gifts and offerings, the first one to bring your tithe into the storehouse. You can't lead from behind. Oh, Lord Tennyson finished the pro poem. He said, when can their glory fade? Oh, wild charge they made. All the world wondered. Honor the charge they made. Honor the light brigade. Noble 600. Are you leading the charge? Or are you following behind to pick up the pieces? You see, we somehow we don't understand that we are at war. We are, there, there, there is a warfare against Christianity today. I don't understand why. We're the good guys. We just want to be nice to people. We want to tell them the truth. We want to pay our bills. We want to help them. We want to look after the sick. Uh, and they don't like us. We're at war. You know, during the Second World War, the English, the English are crazy people. I mean, the horse dies, they say, let's make a pot of tea. <laughs> Are there any English people here? Have you game enough to put up your hand? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, in Australia, we call them pommies, prisoner of Mother England. 
But they're strange people, you see. I mean, they, there was no way in the world they could have beaten Germany. No way. No way. But they invented radar. And they could detect when the, the enemy planes were coming over. But the Germans, they're genius. I mean, they're genius in mine and engineering. They perfected it. And so they got ready for when the British came over. But there were a couple of English farm boys and they had a tiger moth aeroplane there put together with spit and string, you know, and there's, there's, there's two open cockpits and, and they got an idea and they taxied along the farm and they took that plane up in the air and they started going across the channel, they went a long way and they took it up as high as they could and the guy at the back had a paper bag full of Christmas tinsel and he'd hit the guy at the front and he'd level off and he'd throw this Christmas tinsel down through the clouds. The German would pick it up on their radar screen, they'd think it was the Royal Air Force coming, they'd crank up the Luftwaffe, they get the Messerschmitts off the ground and the ak, -AK guns and nothing would happen. So they land the plane, they come back and pour a cup of tea. <laughs> they, they would put some standard petrol in, flip the propeller again and again and again and again and again and finally the Germans say, that's it's Christmas tinsel. And then the boys would call up the Royal Air Force, they'd say, well, it's time to go over and clobber them. <laughs> You know, there were, there were two Englishmen, two Irishmen, two Australians and two Chinese were caught in a shipwreck and they managed to get to the shore. Eight years later, the steamer came past to pick them up. They found the two Chinese had gone into business. The two Irishmen were fighting. Two Australians were gambling. But the two Englishmen hadn't done anything at all. They hadn't been formally introduced. <laughs> the fourth principle I see with Joshua, I hesitate to make the comment, but leadership is loneliness. Leadership is loneliness. I gave the first full lecture on leadership at our church recently to a large group of men. And I emphasize this loneliness. It's not a matter of choice, but a startling realistic fact. Loneliness because others refuse to recognize the full commitment and singleness of purpose and pay that price. Loneliness because leadership vision is very personal. Loneliness because of misunderstanding. Loneliness because leadership has very few counselors at that wavelength. When I first went into real estate years ago, I had a problem and I called my staff together and I told them about the problem. They all left. They wanted security. I thought, well, I won't do that again. Next time I had a problem, I went to my bank manager. He cut off supply. I thought, well, I won't do that again either. Next time I had a problem, I told my competitors. They were happy to hear about it. That's why you have to develop a vertical relationship with the Savior. Loneliness because leadership has very few counselors at that wavelength. Is it biblical? Oh, you bet it is. A man at this particular lecture I gave put up his hand and he, he said, I want to be a leader, but I, I, I like the pe people to feel good about me. I like to... I like him to be glad to see me and, and happy that I'm there. I said, if you want something that's always going to be happy to see you, buy a dog. <laughs> Others said, is it really biblical? Well, I said, Jonah alone in the belly of the whale. Jacob alone wrestling with the angel. John the Baptist alone in the wilderness. Moses alone on Mount Sinai. Daniel alone in the lion. Then Nehemiah alone before the king. David alone before Goliath. Paul alone in prison. Jesus alone, alone in the Garden of Gethsemane. Leadership is loneliness. Some years ago, I was made Special Ambassador of State on Economic Affairs by a foreign government. With it came all the trappings, 15 armed bodyguards with submachine guns. I uh, had the army at my disposal. Mrs. Daniels and I, when we'd get out of the limousine, they'd roll out the carpet and they'd have a band play and they'd put it on television. Uh, we'd go into the government and, uh, behind one inch bulletproof glass and I was called Mr. Ambassador. I agreed to the position as long as the president 
understood I must ma maintain my first loyalty, which you have in 2 Corinthians 5.20, where it says we are all therefore Christ ambassadors. And as an ambassador, you're a cho chosen person. You've got the high, high chosen title of Christian. The second thing about an ambassador is it's given by an authority and you have the highest authority on the heavens and the earth. The third thing about being an ambassador, ambassador ne never ever represents him or herself. You're to represent the one that sent you. Are you a good representation of the Saviour? It's the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you handle people, the way you open your home like an embassy. The fourth thing we see about ambassadors, they always go to a foreign land. You feel sometimes things get awkward down here, you know, like a square pig in a round hole. That's all right, your real citizenship is in heaven. And the final thing about being an ambassador, ambassadors are always called home before war is declared. <laughs> I was walking the streets of Sydney with a pastor friend of mine and as we walked down the street, we saw a pair of shoes in the gutter and we thought, we looked up to heaven, we thought it's happened. <laughs> the rapture has come. In the old days when the king wanted to expand his kingdom and wanted to bring treasury into the crown, he would go to the garrison, he would find someone there that was loyal in battle brave, popular among the men, and supported the king. He would then take him into his wise men and his senate and they would test his character. If he was suitable, he'd be given charge of the entire armed forces to go out and conquer other lands and bring back territory and, and valuables for the king. They would leave in the early morning light. Outside of the walled city, they would march off in silence. The men at the watchtower would watch the king's insignia disappear over the horizon. They'll be gone for many months. The watchtower will be watching for other enemy coming or maybe the king's men returning. And finally, they see the king's insignia starting to come. They sent out some pe special emissaries, how went the battle, if they were victorious, they'd have to wait on the outskirts of the walled city. They would bring the message to the king that they had arrived back, he would make sure that food and, and fresh clothes and armour would go out and wine for them. He would then go to his musicians and ask them to prepare a festival and his poets and ask them to write verse about the hero. Within a very short time, he would call a festival and he would sit on his throne with his bodyguards and wise men each side in front of the king's highway. The people would line the streets to look to see if their loved one had returned or had been slain in battle. They would be on the rooftops, they'd be on carts, anything where they could get a view. And suddenly at the blast of a trumpet, the roar of the crowd, would sound and in. They would march in perfect unison. They'd not look to the right or to the left. They'd be the, those that had been captured carrying all the booty, would have to march in time with chains around them, bring it up to the king. They'd lay it at the king's feet. They would full rank each side. And as the army kept coming in and coming in, the roar of the crowd would be deafening. And finally, it would be finished and a hushed silence would go over the whole city and they'd look to the entrance gates and then suddenly a union of trumpets would sound and then would come the leader, the hero in a white chariot pulled by four white stallions and the roar of the crowd would be deafening. His children would be on trace horses dressed in white and these four stallions would dance 
at the King's Highway. People would cheer them, singers would walk along and sing to the hero. The poets would give verse in praise of the hero because his eye would be fixed upon the King. As the, the, uh, they went up the King's Highway, people would throw down garlands of flowers and, and in the chariot was always a servant holding a garland of flowers above the head of the hero in the form of a crown. And as they went up the king's highway, he would be whispering forever in his ear, all glory is fleeting, all glory is fleeting, all glory is fleeting. Over the next 72 hours, unless this church is vastly different than every other church I've been to, and I've been to nearly a thousand doing the same thing, there's going to be some people that are going to be quite transformed. We've created more millionaires in the Christian church than anyone else in history. And you know who I'm talking to. You know who you are. You know what you're supposed to do. There are older people here that have got to get back into the race. There are younger people here that think they're too young. Let me tell you, you're not too young. My young grandchildren are earning 4,000 a week at 16 and 18 years of age in their own business. But just remember that whatever happens, the glory belongs to him. God bless you. Well, you need to come back tonight to get the rest of the story. There's so much more to tell. Altar ministers, if you would please come up. And as we prepare to dismiss today, let's have every eye closed and every head bowed. And let's go before the Lord right now. If there's anyone that has come into this congregation tonight, you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. It's the most important step that you can make. It's the step that Peter Daniels made in accepting the Lord in 1959 and has changed his life forever. And Jesus can change your life too. So before we leave today, if there's anyone here and you've never made Jesus your Lord and your Savior, if you've been away from the Lord and you want to come back, you want to be filled with God's Holy Spirit to overflowing, with every head bowed and every eye closed, just slip your hand up right now if that's you. If that's you today and you want someone to pray with you before you leave this congregation, to make Jesus your Lord, to come back, to fellowship with Him, to be filled with His Holy Spirit, is there anyone in this place today? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Everybody look up at me. If you need prayer before you go, you feel free to come to this altar and receive what the Lord has for you. Let's pray. We'll be dismissed so we can get back tonight at 6.30 p.m. Father, in the name of Jesus, we honor you. We thank you for what has taken place here and what's going to take place in the life of this church. Lord, we look to you to be enlarged. We look to you to grow. And we thank you and honor you for our guests that have come to impart into the life of this church. We thank you for it today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You are dismissed. We'll see you this evening. Thanks for joining us for our live 11 o'clock Sunday morning service from Eagle Mountain International Church. We want you to know that by going to our bvovradio.org website, you can watch or listen to all of our live services from Eagle Mountain International Church. Or you can listen to EMIC services by rebroadcast as well as on demand by simply going to the BVOV Radio website at bvovradio.org. Our complete broadcast schedule is available to you there by clicking on Eagle Mountain International Church broadcast times. Be sure to join us on Wednesday evening for our midweek service at Eagle Mountain International Church. Until then, have a blessed week. And now, back to faith-building music here on BVOV Radio.